Rajiv, what an absolute pleasure to have you on this stage. Uh, I can say welcome. Um, Rajiv and I met uh, last year after 48 years. And uh, we then met four hours later by sheer coincidence. We went to college together. Rajiv was always an academic star, and you've just heard a list of his achievements, which make me feel largely illiterate and unread, but I'll still try and uh, uh, get something, some flavor of his erudition and depth of concern about society across uh, to you. When we met last time, it was about uh, this book, Between Hope and Despair, which is a collection of 100 very deep essays rooted in uh, ethics. It's ethical reflections on contemporary India. And since then, he's come out with this book, which is a, an essay, a large essay, Reimagining Indian Secularism. Those of you who saw the program would have seen that we were supposed to have another speaker as well, which is uh, Mr. Parakala Prabhakar. Um, he unfortunately has a flight to catch and will not make it. And uh, I was looking for commonalities between what uh, Mr. Prabhakar has written and what Rajiv has written about. And uh, this conversation will, of course, largely be with Rajiv, but I can't resist but begin with a quote from Parakal's uh, book, which I think will resonate with you, Rajiv. He's talking about the resignation of uh, the well-known columnist, Pratap Bhanu Mehta, mm. from Ashoka University. And in his resignation letter, Pratap wrote, my association with the university may be considered a political liability. My public writing in support of a politics that tries to honor constitutional values of freedom and equal respect for all citizens is perceived to carry risks for the university. What does this say to you about the state of the republic? Well, I think uh, the thing that comes to my mind is that there is a lot of energy in the people, particularly the young people, uh, they're full of enthusiasm. They want to do something. They want to achieve something. They want to make their life better. But uh, at the same time, the moral restraints uh, that existed within which to pursue their good life those moral restraints seem to be disappearing. And that is a cause for great worry. Uh, because ambition is good, but limitless ambition. Uh, trying to achieve uh, something at any cost, trying to pursue your good even if it harms others, uh, violating uh, minimal decency, uh, in the pursuit of your good and your glory, uh, that is a recipe for social disaster. And that sort of worries me uh, because what we are witnessing today, and I'm not talking about just what is happening in the last few years, but it's been happening progressively for some time now, probably began in 1991 uh, or earlier. But uh, what we're witnessing is a kind of a flattening of a moral uh, landscape where anything goes. And that worries me a great deal. So while I'm very, uh, uh, very much uh, uh, kind of, uh, I'm encouraged by the, by the bubbling enthusiasm and the aspiration of young India, I'm also worried that uh, this, uh, you know, the, the Greeks called it pleonexia. Uh, you grab things, and uh, there is no, there is no, there is no limit to, to, you know, what you can go for, uh, and that sort of worries me a lot. Yeah, but in this particular case, we are talking in this particular court. What's implicit in this court is that. Um, um, 
the university, as typified by uh, Pratap Bhanu Mehta, sought to expand the vision and the understanding of people and the powers that be, whether those powers were motivated by their own sense of restriction or that came from elsewhere, wanted to restrict that. Yes, so, uh, I mean, it's linked to what I said, yeah. that, uh, I mean, in this case, it may have happened because of some compulsion, but the ability to, to stand up to power and to uphold the integrity of the university and its professors, that, uh, that backbone, uh, was probably not shown by those who run the university. And that's what made Pratap leave. And I feel sorry about it. Sure. But it's linked to the point that I made that uh, they, you know, beyond a point, the, the, uh, uh, those who ran the university should have realized that enough is enough. We're not going to succumb to this pressure if it is true that this happened. I mean, I. I don't, I don't know the details. Yeah, we don't know the inside story, but, 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 but uh, it seems, if it is seems true, implicit then over here. I think people have to stand up to certain values. And uh, I, don't think, I don't think that happened. I'm very sorry that Pratap had to leave the university. Yeah, but if we go to your own alma mater, the one after you and I were together, which was to GNU, and uh, uh, we've seen that universities have become a special target for diminishing this space for critical thought. So um, while we can kind of dismiss a uh, private university which is uh, being run by industrialists who succumb to all kinds of power, um, the bulk of young people are going to go to public universities. JNU is ranked as one of the top universities in India. How do you preserve the space for dissent in public universities? Again, I mean, uh, you know, these universities are meant to run, uh, they're, they're meant to be autonomous. I mean, just as the BBC is an autonomous institution, even though it's funded by the state, there has to be a distinction between the state and the government. And uh, uh, the state must not, this government cannot interfere in, the, in, the, in many public spaces. In the universities wants a space. As a matter of fact, the university is not a place just wh wh where you just learn. University is, place, university is a place where you learn to be good citizens, uh, constitutional patriots. And I think JNU had a diversity of opinion. Some of them were pretty, uh, you know, uh, I would say politically outrageous. But that's part of the game. Uh, it is an important function of the university to nourish uh, those who, who are able to uh, sidestep uh, whatever is the academic uh, and public norm of uh, speech and tolerate them, right? And so JNU may have had a few excesses, but when we were teaching, I mean, when I was teaching there, uh, we never saw them. I mean, we, we saw some of these things as, you know, pretty wild. <laughs> But there was no constraint on anybody. They could say some things. And by the time these, by the time these students who were once, you know, saying things which were wild when they came out, many of them joined uh, government service. And believe it or not, many of these people that I meet today are what I call constitutional patriots. You know, they're patriotic and they stand by the constitution. And that is what we must produce. And it is, these are, uh, people who are produced only when there is a free and uh, free public sphere where everybody is able to speak openly and freely and uh, you know critically about each other uh, through mutual encounter they learn from one another and they become better human beings and better citizens you use the word patriotism uh, I would submit that uh, patriotism today has been replaced by nationalism and a lot of people think they're the same. I just mm. want you as a, as a professor to illustrate the difference between the two. Well, I mean, it's, it's very difficult uh, to be a patriot uh, without being a nationalist today. Uh, because a uh, 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 to be a patriot is to, to express a love for your own land, uh, for, your, uh, for, your, for your political community. Uh, 
and, uh, and, and to do things uh, uh, not just to, 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 to do things that nourish it. And one of the things, and this is something which was said quite openly yesterday in some of the conversations that I heard, one of the things that one has to learn is to identify a problem, a mistake, uh, a, 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 some uh, s steps that have been taken, which are taking, which are, which are uh, making you go away from uh, the good sort of uh, path uh, that you were originally meant to take, and this uh, identification of that uh, mistake is not possible without both a critical, without a critical sense, and without open discussion, and. Uh, those are the things that you really value uh, in a patriot. The, to do, uh, what is it? Uh, to identify uh, uh, the good in your country and as well as what's going wrong with your country. Uh, to, to, to stand by what is good and to rectify what is wrong. That is the function of a good patriot. And since uh, a patriot is now seen as a nationalist. I would just say that uh, in order to be a good nationalist, you should be able to do exactly that, to take pride in whatever uh, are the achievements of a nation and to, to feel ashamed by uh, what, you know, what it has done, which is, which is uh, morally wrong. But in the... Thank you. But in the current context, asking a question is seen as being anti-national. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, I mean, I can't un understand why that is the case. Uh, there is enough room for people to dissent. Uh, the government has authority uh, to do what it wants. Uh, if it has a, a, a public... Uh, on its side, it shouldn't, you know, feel uh, any, you know, threat if there are, if there is dissent. So I really don't understand why uh, that is the case. But Rajiv, I'm going to press you and say, it is your task as an observer of the political scene to try and at least speculate why this is the case. Why questioning the direction which the country is taking is being seen as being anti-national. I think there is, a, a, there is a fundamental insecurity that a, a large number of people will not, of their own free will, support your agenda. That, uh, that there are, there, they, there is, there is there, they know that uh, whatever support they are getting is because of fear uh, or because of threats of being forced uh, into doing uh, things, certain things. And that fundamental insecurity forces you to not tolerate dissent because, uh, because uh, that deep questioning is something that uh, can spread can spread and it can lead to not only questioning but challenges to protest and maybe uh, it can turn against them. I don't think that should be the case. No democratic people, you know, the whole of our democracy runs on the premise that those who are in power today can lose power and those who are not in power can gain power and this can keep happening all the time. So. In a, in a democracy, nobody should be, nobody is a permanent loser and nobody is a permanent winner. And uh, this kind of cycle of uh, winning and losing will continue. And even this government can, may lose tomorrow, but it can regain power, uh, uh, you know, five years from now. So I don't see why uh, they should uh, fear dissent. I think it could be that they just want to hold on to power to implement a certain agenda, uh, which they believe can only be implemented if, if they are there in power for a sufficiently long period, and if there is no opposition to them. 
One of the framings that I liked in what you said was to consider the Republic as an ongoing conversation. Nation, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Both. Yeah. Yeah. Both. Okay. Both. Nation. Both. Yeah. Um, but I, I like these days to think of Republic as being a lovely romantic notion of what a nation should be like. And, um, uh, you know, with uh, a little bit of a background in marketing and um, um, management, we like to reduce things to very simple concepts. And I came up with three Ps, which to my mind are crucial to this conversation. Um, the first is the parliament, the second is the press, and the third is protest. Mm. Uh, I'd be happy to listen to a fourth P or any other alphabet for that matter. But staying with this for a moment, I'd just like you to discuss where you see the state of each of these media of uh, conversation between the people and the government, as you've tracked them over the last 45 years. Well, I, I did sort of, in between hope and despair, I did propose the idea that a nation is not just an aggregate of individuals. It is, a, it is people connected with one another. And it's a people that are not only connected, but it continuous conversation uh, with each other about uh, what its central issues are, uh, where we should be, where, what we were in the past, and where we are in the present, and what we are, you know, which direction we are likely to take in future. And that conversation is very important. And anybody who disrupts that conversation is really an anti-national. Uh, not those who converse with one another and disagree with one another. They are, you know, uh, nationalists because they're committed to that conversation. Unfortunately, uh, today, for various reasons, it seems, and again, this is my personal impression, and I'll be very happy to be proven wrong, but I fear that this conversation has been replaced by a very oppressive silence. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm surprised that you, you know, I hear, I read in the newspapers something really horrible, such as, you know, man being beaten to death or lynched or something like that, and I go to, 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 to my park and, uh, you know, walk with my friends, and uh, nobody talks about that. They talk about everything else under the sun, but they don't talk about this terrible thing that has happened only yes, yesterday evening and which has been reported. So I, I imagine that the first thing that you read is something as horrible as that. I mean, imagine not only that, I mean, uh, what I find really painful and the, why I say that the limits, the moral limits have been crossed is that uh, not only is there violence, that has been there, you know, for ever since the formation of the Republic. But those who are violent are not celebrated. I mean, I was totally aghast when uh, a police officer was being lynched. And uh, after a great deal of pressure, those people who were uh, meant to have lynched him, uh, they were caught and put in jail. But when they were, they were very quickly released, and one of the ministers of the government, or perhaps the former minister of the government, went and garlanded them, and nobody said anything. Now, this is unprecedented. It's unprecedented to, to see this happen. And that's why I said, I mean, these limits have been crossed earlier, uh, but what we are witnessing now is something which I could never, ima never have imagined. And when we were in college, we would never have imagined something like that to happen, that we will actually celebrate the murderer. We will garland. And it's not just ordinary people. That also one can imagine. But it's, it's high officials who will, uh, you know, garland. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. I, I should be. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not uh, used to public speeches like this. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, that's, the, that's something which, uh, uh, and that's the worry that I was talking about, this moral flattening, the flattening of the moral landscape. People losing a sense of the distinction between good and bad, right and wrong. I mean, I, this is one of the starting points of my book. You know, I call it ethical reflections. And uh, I believe that we are uh, ethical creatures fundamentally. Our ethical 
space, our ethical horizon may have shrunk a lot. Uh, it may just be something now which is restricted to ourselves or our family. But at one time, our dil tang nahi tha. You know, uh, we were uh, large-hearted and uh, we thought big. We were thinking about the entire community, about the people at large. I think that seems to have taken a back seat. And that uh, is something which is, is massively worrying. Because when that happens, when the moral space shrinks, uh, then the way is open to, uh, to, to all kinds of brutality, uh, to callousness, uh, to, to, to insensitivity. And I see, I, I, I worry about that. I mean, this is of course a very civilized and decent space, but you step out of here and you can find areas where, where you know, literally anything goes. And, our, and I, I worry about our leaders. I mean, take for example, uh, a recent incident in the parliament when uh, uh, to another Muslim MP, uh, one of our MPs uh, said all kinds of nasty things and there was hardly any, uh, he was not reprimanded by anybody. Not only that, he was made a key campaigner in uh, the Rajasthan elections yeah, which uh, yeah, just yeah. concluded. Um, so my question to you is, uh, is it that the ethical dimension of human beings is uh, shrinking and or is it that they, a situation has been created where they are afraid to express their ethical concerns. Sorry? A space has been created, mm. an atmosphere, where they're afraid to express their ethical concerns because well, they... Well, both. Uh, I, think, uh, I think people uh, are afraid to speak out. But in a democratic society, they should not be afraid to speak out. But I think more fundamentally, I think the, they are losing a sense of what is right and what is wrong, uh, what is good and what is bad. I mean, we are creatures of desire, but we also have the capacity to critically evaluate those desires and to make a distinction between what is worthy and what is not. And even among all the worthy desires, we can identify one desire which is of much greater worth. And uh, as human beings, we strive to achieve that. We have, you know, we have an ultimate good, uh, which gives us meaning, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which, which keeps us ticking in a, in a very fundamental way. And I think uh, if we lose that capacity for self-reflective evaluation, then we will be considerably diminished. Uh, we just, you know, th that's the economic man, you know. Homo economicus. Homo yeah. economicus, yeah. who's a rational maximizer and who can only uh, do uh, cost-benefit analysis. But you can't, uh, he has an end and he will strive to realize that end, but he will never evaluate that end to see whether that is something good or bad. And I think as we are fundamental, as fundamentally, we are ethical creatures but we're losing that sense of ethics. And it's, that's what's being, it's being hammered very badly. You know, I want to talk briefly about uh, uh, one of the most ethical human beings I know who is in college with us, Harsh Mandar, mm -hmm. who has spoken truth to power more loudly and more bravely and yet more quietly with a very, very uh, deep humanity than others. But even as we speak, his offices are being raided. If there is some kind of foreign currency um, violation, then that's fair. But it seems that these uh, uncoverings of these violations happen disproportionately to those who speak truth to power. Well, uh, I'm very pained at that. Uh, this is not the way democracies function. So, Rajiv, this brings, you know, you've said this is not the way it should be. Mm. in various forms about three times during this conversation. Mm. And uh, I agree with you mm. on all of those. The operative question is that um, how do you restore the nation to that kind of situation which, in your view, as a political scientist, is desirable? I still have faith. You see, uh, I, 
in, in one of my books, I make use of a very famous Scottish philosopher, Alistair McIntyre, his distinction between internal goods and external goods. Every social practice is driven by an internal good. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, even a practice such as playing cricket uh, is, is uh, underlying it is not just uh, uh, the goal of winning, but also to develop certain skills, which skills are always evaluated by certain standards of excellence. And whatever it is that you achieve through that excellence is something which is believed to be a, a shared good. So, for example, I mean, for example, people uh, who, uh, Pakistani uh, bowlers who developed uh, the art of reverse swinging, right? It was, you could have seen it as something which is, you know, something that your competitor is doing, but that's not what cricketers did. They learned that art. It became a collective possession. Uh, and uh, every social practice, no matter what it is, cricket is just one example, but politics is another. Uh, politics is meant to, to identify and realize the collective good. And uh, you have to, there are certain virtues, uh, standards of excellence, which are part and parcel of politics. And so all social practices have these internal goods, but we can, send, we can lose a sense of these external goods if, we, if our primary aim is to achieve goods which are external to that practice. Like winning, for example. Like pure winning. Yeah. I mean, we, of course. But I mean, the three things that come to mind straight away are money, fame, and power. These are the external goods uh, which can uh, waylay you uh, in your striving for the internal goods of social practices. And if that happens, then all the social practices, the value of social practices, the internal goods of social practices will be lost and we'll be only aiming for external goods. And uh, just remind me why I started to discuss <laughs> uh, I, uh, it. Was, it was about where, where is the internal mechanisms to restore order? Oh, right. So, so yeah, that's it. right. So I believe that, uh, you know, all of us who are uh, victims and of external goods, uh, I consider external goods to be a byproducts of uh, following your, uh, you know, following uh, or sustaining those sort of practices through which very important internal goods are, are, are realized. But uh, we can, of course, as a byproduct, we can achieve those external goods. But if you keep aiming only for external goods, then, you know, you will never create a good society. I think uh, the middle class is particularly prone to confuse the two, but ordinary folks who are, who are not striving for fame or, or power or wealth or unaffected by them, I think they are our hope. Uh, they will, they, are, they have a lot of uh, uh, energy. Uh, they are still not, they may eventually get impacted by these external goods, but at the moment, uh, they don't. This and I think Gandhi exactly. realized that. The means versus the end. Yes. Yeah. It's, 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 it's so so my, my, I still have faith in ordinary people of India and in the young, because they too are, you know, they're idealist, uh, idealists, and uh, they still have a sense of of that important discrimination between, you know, what is right and wrong. And I think with these, uh, we may be able to restore uh, the values of the Republic and, and get the nation on the right path. You know, staying with Gandhi for a moment um, uh, and to the theme of your essay on secularism, um, there were two things that struck me. Uh, one was about um, um, the fact that Preserving plurality in religious uh, plurality in society is, uh, uh, of course, one of the primary goals of secularism. But there was something else you said that really struck me, which is that preserving plurality within Hinduism 
is also a major task of uh, secularism. And I thought this was very, very lovely. Do you see that in danger of being lost now? Well, you know, uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, ancient India had a pluralist ethos. Uh, there were groups that believed in many gods and goddesses. There were groups that believed in no gods and goddesses. And uh, there was subsequently a group that believed in one god. And there were groups that believed in neither gods and goddesses nor in God. Uh, in, in India uh, had a, a very uh, thriving pluralist ethos. Uh, our atheistic traditions were some of the strongest exactly at the time that many of the idea of God was, was taking root in Palestine. Uh, in the Abrahamic traditions. You know, we had uh, a thriving uh, interpretation of the Vedas, which did not depend on the idea of the God. Mimansa has no conception of God, and that was the dominant hermeneutics of, of, of the early uh, uh, first millennia. Buddhism has no God. Jainism had no God. The Ajavikas had no God. So we had a very vibrant atheistic tradition but we also had a polytheist, so-called, and these are terms that we use now, but we had a polytheistic tradition, and we had a monist, mon monist, monistic tradition. I won't call it monotheistic, but subsequently we also had a monot monotheistic tradition. So we, we had a tremendous pluralist ethos. I want and, to interrupt. I want and that ethos, that pluralist ethos, I mean, what we call Hindu is, uh, at that time, only a ge geographical term. It did not have a religious connotation. That religious connotation, it began to acquire, I would say, around the time that uh, there were uh, Turks and Afghans, uh, 13th, 12th, 13th, 14th century, uh, some vague idea of a Hindu identity began to be formed. But that Hindu identity contained this plurality within it. I want to interrupt you with a quote, which is from your book, uh, which says that um, Western secularism's hostile response to religion is motivated by a certain conception of it, a total exclusivist system within which a particular ethic and a specific set of social norms are tightly knit, hmm. as contrasted with India. However, a system which is monistic and therefore does not allow for pluralism and that craves for state power. Hmm. And so my question to you is that is this desire to flatten and narrow the conception of Hinduism. How tied up is this to the craving for state power? Uh, you know, this idea of religion uh, was perfected in 16th, 17th century. Uh, it had three features. One is a very uh, sharp distinction between a true god and a false god. It's been around earlier in the Abrahamic traditions, but really sh got sh sharpened in the, in, during the wars of religion. But something other than that is also extremely important, and that is uh, religion becomes total. It's a total, it's a comprehensive system. So, you know, uh, uh, on the one hand, you have a certain ethics of ultimate self-fulfillment. Uh, and on the other hand, you have norms of social interaction. And these can remain separate. They don't have to be knit together into one system. Uh, but in uh, Christianity, uh, these were brought together and they became one total system. In India, it didn't happen. And, and that is why you could be a Jain uh, 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 but also be part of a certain social structure, which of course was hierarchical, undoubtedly not something that we celebrate today, but you could be a part of the caste system, which is widely believed to be, you know, uh, uh, sanctified by, by the Dharamshastras, 
and therefore you can see it as Hindu. So you could be a Hindu at one level and a Jain at another level. Some of the most, uh, some of the greatest Buddhist philosophers were Brahmins. Nagarjuna comes to mind. So you could be a Brahmin and a Buddhist, right? Uh, and, and that happened not only with uh, uh, those religions that we identify with, say, you know, with the subcontinent that were born, but even those that came from outside. I mean, Allah became one of the many gods for many people. Just as there was Ram and Krishna, there was also Allah. And those people could be pursuing uh, what Allah dictates to you, uh, but still be part of the caste system. So there was, this was, the, we always had... You this can this say, I understand, Rajiv. I'm just asking you right now, do you see this space for plurality shrinking? So this, the Hindu uh, plurality, uh, Hindu plurality is, is still very much part of uh, uh, Hindus, uh, but, uh, but by an attempt to make it into a national religion and by introducing this true and false idea into nationalism, uh, I think we are excluding uh, many people whose ancestors were born here and who were probably the original inhabitants. I mean, if you're looking at a vast majority of Muslims, uh, in India, and if they, if as many people believe, they were converts from uh, Dalits, uh, sorry, from the um, you know the the most uh, the lowest uh, caste, then uh, these castes, the Dasas, are either uh, so because they were conquered by others, and they must be the original inhabitants, or they were enslaved. Uh, so. Uh, I think some, some Muslim may, may be the, the most original inhabitants of this. I mean, as original as anybody else. And uh, I don't know how they can be, uh, simply because they have a different faith, how they can be treated as outsiders. But a certain nationalization of religion by making Hinduism into a national religion, be making a distinction between what is true, uh, what is a true Hindu national and what is not a true Hindu national, right? Rajiv, and, we and could that talk. is what is creating a lot of problems. And you can do that only by homogenizing Hinduism. So uh, I don't think this plurality can be eradicated by anybody, right? So even the, the most uh, fiercest oppon opponents of this plurality will recognize this. Uh, that homogenization is not possible. That's a very but hopeful note to, to sort of, we'll have to end here because oh. uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions and we don't have very much time. I'm going to start from the back with that young man with his hand up. Yeah, please. Can somebody get him a mic? Yeah, yeah, I see the other. Yeah, the man with the book in his hand. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Karan Azad. And I've made an observation. No, every, just a question, please. Yeah, yeah. Every time I try to discuss about how state is getting involved uh, with religion these days with people around me, they tell me several times that secular aspirations are only for atheists. Why is it so that in the mind of the po populace, religion and spirit of secularism cannot coexist these days? Secularism and atheism are two very different ideas. Uh, Indian secularism in particular is always committed to religious pluralism. Apart from that, it is also committed to opposing exclusions and domination that are sanctified, that are sanctioned by, 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 by modern religions. So any kind of oppression of women, which is grounded in uh, any uh, scripture will be opposed by a secularist. Any oppression of caste, uh, which is once again grounded, because that's not always grounded in a scripture, is grounded in scripture will be opposed by a secularist. Secularists are against intra and in, intra-religious domination, uh, but uh, I think the, the first commitment of a secularist is to preserve religious pluralism, uh, which is a, a unique contribution of India. Uh, most countries in the world have 
been religiously homogenous. And they have been uh, made religiously homogenous by ethically undesirable ways in the 16th or 17th century. The one example that comes immediately to my mind is 1492 Spain, when Muslims and Jews were thrown out by, 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 by Catholics uh, when they took power. And this became the story of many West European countries. In India, this never happened till the 20th century. Uh, we have a very proud record of very little uh, uh, religious persecution. And, and there are no wars of religion in pre-modern times. There are skirmishes, there, are, there is some, uh, there is conflict, there is hostility. There's a lot of uh, hate speech in, in Indian, uh, you find a lot of that, but you don't find, uh, you know, uh, historical evidence of major religious persecution or of religious wars. And I'm afraid by borrowing the, the so we have a lot to learn from each other, including from Europe. We have, you know, tremendous values, European values that we, we have learned from. Uh, but oh, two ideas which are extremely pernicious that we have taken from Europe is the modern conception of religion, which sees itself as homogenous and which sees itself as exclusivist. And there is an idea of an ethnic nation state, which was to begin with a religious state, uh, a theocratic state, or a state with a very strong alliance with a particular religion. That's also a very European idea. And unfortunately, in the 20th century, we've taken that. And I'm afraid we, that we are losing uh, our, our connection with our own uh, 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 civilizational ethos and our own historic past that we've done that. This is slavish imitation of Europe, Europe uh, which I'm very against. I love what you said in your book, which is uh, India is uh, an, or should be a nation of one book. And that book is a constitution. Sir. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, how do you connect uh, and how do you respond, both of you, to Allama Iqbal's the description of Jawaharlal Nehru when Jawaharlal Nehru visited him on his deathbed and he said, Nehru, you are a patriot and Jinnah is a politician. Oh. Well, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about Jinnah to make that comment. Uh, but whatever impression that I have, I think he became a very cynical politician in the 1940s. So, if uh, Alama, uh, Iqbal had already died by then, but maybe he knew something about Jinnah that many of us don't know. Maybe he was always a bit of a politician. The, about Nehru, I'm pretty certain that uh, he was right. There's, there's somebody standing right in the back. Can you get a mic to him? Oh, there's already somebody there for him. Thank you. Hello. Uh, sir, my question is in contemporary times, uh, in a democratic country and a constitutional country like India, when religion, a particular religion or ideology is being imposed onto the whole country through various mediums. How do you think that it is harming the ethos and the structure, the fundamental structure of the country as a civilization that India is and India was? I think uh, the, it is harming uh, the civilizational ethos and it is also harming and disturbing uh, our social fabric, or you know what Gandhiji used to call communal harmony, it is harming that. But I'm pretty confident that this will be a blip, and that uh, soon enough we'll 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 be able to overcome this. This is not going to last very long because you know 5,000 years of civilization cannot be wiped out by 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 uh, in in five ten years. We don't have much time, but this gentleman here, can you get a mic to him? Right in the front. Oh, that's a 50-yard sprint. Yeah, yeah, last question. A particular type of nationalism, a particular type of nationalism doesn't harm nation. Nation, that's what we understand as a political concept. Number two, 
uh, I think better I to think be a humanist have... than a nationalist. That's what Ravindranath Tagore said. I think we should transcend from nationalism to humanist. What is your right. opinion? Thank you. Very briefly. No, I, I agree with both. I mean, I agree with you. I think the, there is a, you know, we, Gandhi and uh, the anti-colonial struggle sort of brought people together and bound them into a nation. These were very diverse people with very different languages, different faiths, uh, different ideologies. They all came together under one umbrella, and that is what we called a nation. And that nation, the state for that nation, was a very different kind of state. Now, what we've done is to narrow our conception of the nation, uh, of belonging to what some people perceive to be uh, a Hindu, uh, you know, ethos or Hindu community, and people want a nation for itself. This is a very European, West European idea.